Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank Vanderlei for the organization and, and the organizing committee for this beautiful symposium. Thank Dan for bringing together so many interesting people. Uh, I am at the Federal University in Rio, and I'm going to talk about anti-hydrogen. Of course, the inspiration from Dan is quite clear if you take out the first four letters. Um, I'll go directly to the point. Time is short. Um, there are some discrete symmetries in physics which are very important. One of them is parity. If you invert the space, physics was believed to be invariant under parity. And uh, Lee and Young proposed a mechanism in the weak interactions by which parity would be, would be uh, violated. It was seen, and they got the Nobel Prize in 57 for that. Essentially, we have left-handed particles and right-handed antiparticles. There is something missing. The universe is missing the symmetry. Well, afterwards, uh, it was proposed that uh, if you use a charge conjugation together with parity, then that would be a good symmetry of physics. And uh, we all know the story. Cronin, Fitch got the Nobel Prize for the k on uh, asymmetry. So our world seems to produce more uh, particles than antiparticles. Uh, finally, uh, if we do all three of these discrete symmetries, parity, charge conjugation, and time reversal, then physics is believed to be invariant. Okay? It is a, a CPT theorem. This is in the, in the basis of uh, quantum field theory, the standard model, and uh, there is a theorem proven in flat space. So is, symmetry, is CPT really a good symmetry? That's a big question. In the beginning of the universe, you should have produced as much antimatter as you produce matter, but we have a big problem. Where is the antimatter? Essentially, this is called a baryogenesis, uh, as Asper has put. This is one of the black clouds, clouds in, in the physics horizon. Where is the antimatter in the universe? Basically, we have looked for gamma rays coming from matter, you know, electrons meeting positrons from stars made of antimatter, and we see no really strong gamma ray emission from primordial star, you know, stars made of antimatter, for instance, okay? Um, there's another experiment. So basically, we don't have a good story for the Big Bang. We don't know exactly what happened to the antimatter. Uh, of course, our standard model has a lot of other problems. We don't have a full unification of the forces. We don't know what is 80% of what composes the universe, dark matter, dark energy. So we are very ignorant. So we got to learn more and test more our theories. Uh, Sam Ting, a professor from MIT, led this experiment to look for anti-alpha particles in, uh, in a satellite. Now they are in the second version, this AMS2, and it's sensitive to a part in 10 to the 9. So they can detect one anti-alpha particle now for 10 to the 9 alpha particles. Okay? And the result from the first one was zero. There's no anti-alpha up there. So essentially, where is the antimatter? So what we do, we go to the lab and we decide to test this theorem in, a, in, in your optical table. Okay? So you try to make, we are trying to make an atomic experiment to test this very fundamental physics. So the idea is to make an anti-hydrogen atom, so an atom made of an antiproton and a positron, shine a laser like we did with the hydrogen atom, excite, for instance, the 1s, 2s transition, that's a very high quality factor transition, shine the same laser in an anti-hydrogen atom and ask, is the spectrum the same? Are the energy levels the same? So that's the basic question. Uh, there are other issues as well. People have thought about, have speculated about anti-gravity for many, many years. Does antimatter fall under the gra gravitation of Earth the same way as matter or not? Okay? So these are questions that we want to uh, approach. So go going back to that slide, we want to do a CPT test with atomic system, hydrogen versus anti-hydrogen, 1s, 2s. Uh, this is done today, the 1s2s transition by the group of Ted Hench and French colleagues, to four parts in 10 to the 15. 
that's amazing. Okay, this is a, a number on a fundamental uh, transition that is calculable. Okay, uh, and we have done at MIT under Dan and, and, and Tom Greytack with trapped hydrogen. At the time, we had a, a record on this resolution, this transition, a few parts of 10 to the 12 with a 400 microkelvin trapped hydrogen atoms. Okay, but we didn't have, uh, uh, we didn't do absolute measurement. This was just a resolution, and uh, so this can be improved. So in 1997, just after my, my finished my PhD, I joined the group. We started this collaboration at CERN. Michael Holzscheider, a friend of uh, Rainer Blatt, was leading this effort called Athena Collaboration. And we start this experiment to first make the anti-hydrogen atoms. And you got to make it cold. You got to make it slow so that you can do this kind of high precision uh, measurement. Uh, by the way, I got into this because Dan was in the Danish society meeting. He gave a talk and he was approached by Jeff Hanks who asked him to join this group and he said, oh no, why don't you, why don't you call Claudio? And that's how actually I got into this in the first place. So thanks to institutions like CERN, thanks to society being so generous with us physicists, CERN exists, and at CERN there is a facility that is dedicated to these anti-hydrogen experiments. At, in the beginning there were only three, uh, our group here, Jerry Gabriel's group, uh, ATRAP, and a group uh, doing anti-protonic helium called Azakusa, a very nice experiment as well. Okay? Um, by the way, CERN was, was inspired by Rabi when he was in the UNESCO after the war. It was a way that he proposed that scientists would get together back in Europe that was devastated by the war and start a joint project. And Rabi was a supervisor of Ramsey, which was a, who was a supervisor of Dan. And so the story goes, again, there are connections to Dan. So basically, this is the only decelerator that I know of at CERN. It's a machine that takes antiprotons and decelerate and send a beam of antiprotons to the experiments every 100 seconds. Okay? So every 100 seconds we get about a few million antiprotons. So this is in Geneva, this is the LHC. Uh, and how does the first version of the experiment work? We had then antiprotons from CERN, we have a pinning trap where we capture the antiprotons in the other side, we had a, a radioactive source that produces positrons. They are moderated, they are accumulated here. Then we transfer them to the side of the antiprotons, and then we try to mix them and make the anti-hydrogen atoms. In the first version, this Athena version, there was no trap for the atoms, for the neutral atoms. So the atoms made would hit the wall and annihilate. And we detect them by annihilation signal in these detectors. So this, uh, the pinning trap, I'm not going to explain, but essentially it's a, a dynamical loading process. You get a bunch of ant antiprotons coming in. You have these electrodes. Uh, you have a big n potential here in this electrode that reflects the antiprotons. They are negative, so you have, say, minus 5,000 uh, volts here. And so when the bunch comes in, it tries to reflect, and then you close this other this other uh, uh, electrode, and you keep the antiprotons closed, uh, uh, trapped there. The big magnetic field on axis avoid them to leave uh, radially, and the way we do is we first preload electrons in this trap. Electrons are lep leptons, they're very light, so their rotation around the magnetic field is, has a lot of, of uh, acceleration, and therefore they emit radiation like crazy. So the antiprotons that are trapped are at about 5 keV of kinetic energy, that's millions of Kelvin, and in about a minute, they are cooled down to the local temperature. This is inside a, a, a cryostat, so it, to about few Kelvin, okay? This is given for free. Uh, of course, to trap these antiprotons, even though CERN has a decelerator, we have to lose most of them in this degrader. They pass a little window where most of them annihilate, and we get just a few that have thermalized. Okay. From the other side, the, the uh, radioactive source emits positrons continuously, 
So you can't do this dynamic loading of the trap. So what you do is you use buffer gas and positrons colliding with nitrogen. They have a, a probability of losing energy and they collect here. I'm not going to have time to describe details. So now you have antiprotons and positrons. This is so-called the nested trap. There are different charges. So in the pinning trap, you can't have a tra uh, trap in the same place for a positive and a negative charge. So what you do is you trap one at the side of the other. And then we give some energy to the antiprotons, and they cross through the positrons, and they can form antihydrogen atoms. And uh, you need, uh, it's a, you, you need a, a second positron. You need a, it's a, another body because you have to preserve momentum and energy. So a collision between an antiproton and two positrons, they can, this can be captured, and the positron leaves with the excess momentum and energy. Or it can be a photon, emission of photon, which can be spontaneous or can be stimulated by a laser. That's the basic idea. Once the atom is formed, it can hit the wall, it annihilates. The antiproton annihilates into pions, and these charged pions leave charge in silicon plates that can be red. So these silicon plates, they are segmented, they have lines and columns, so we can see where they went through. And there's a silicon plate, one behind the other, so I can retrace where the pion came from. And then, typically, you have three, five pions, so you can find out where the antiproton annihilated. And the positron annihilates into two gamma photons back to back, 500. 11 keV, which you can detect in crystals, cesium iodide, for instance. So this was first shown in 2002. We showed that once you find the vertex where the antiproton had annihilated, you look for two other crystals lit in your detector, and you can trace an angle from here to here. And you can plot the number of annihilation events as a function of cosine of this angle. And what you can see is a clear excess signal when this angle is 180 degrees, showing that you had, at that point, at that time, annihilation of an antiproton and an annihilation of a positron at that point. Okay? So basically, this was the first production of, of code, not code for this community, but code for, very code for high energy physics community, okay? uh, anti-hydrogen atoms. Well, this. Uh, made a big splash in the media and so on. Uh, but soon, with some tests, we realized that these anti-hydrogen atoms were not so cold. They were between 100 to 1,000 degrees Kelvin. So there was no hope to trap them in a magnetic trap. So at that point, we started a new collaboration. Half of, of Athena and other groups joined, uh, particularly uh, Joe Fajans from California, Berkeley. And we started the Alpha collaboration. Now, this collaboration started already with a, a magnetic trap in place. So the idea was to form the antihydrogen atoms inside a magnetic trap. So here you can see an octopolar field. The magnet was built at, at, Los at, at uh, 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 Brookhaven. It's a very nice technique. What are the problems? The pinning trap for the positrons and for the antiprotons have to be in a very homogeneous magnetic field. And now we want to put a magnetic trap for the neutral atom, so you have to put a highly inhomogeneous field. And these two things are incompatible. If you put an inhomogeneous field, for instance, a quadrupole, the field lines, even though the, the, the magnitude of the field is constant cylindrically, it's cylindrically symmetric, the field lines are not. They go into the wall. And you can see a distortion of the positron plasma as soon as you, you put your plasma there. So the way around that was not to use a quadrupole, a Yaffe Pritchard trap, but to use an octopole radially. So that if we keep our sample, our trapped uh, positrons in the very center, they don't get much affected by this field in homogeneity. Okay? So they can survive churning on this field. Now, this is how it looks like in the alpha configuration. In a lot of, we have about, uh, uh, 17 here electrodes, but we have many more. We had about 33 electrodes in the spinning trap because we have to manipulate, we have to bring the particles, cool, do this, do that, rotate wall, do all sorts of things. So we have a, a magnetic field which is high here where we capture antiprotons and then goes lower where we are going to trap the 
make the atoms and trap them. That's a, a view of the, of the thing. And here's where we make the antihydrogen and capture the cold ones. But for that, so this is a, a quick view of the experiment. It's, it's a much larger scale than, than, uh, than the one before. Uh, our detector now doesn't have crystals, only silicon, but we can make very good images of individual antiprotons. And uh, we can measure, uh, have a qualitative idea on temperatures and density by no, no uh, destructive methods. We can uh, give a pulse, electric pulse, and the plasma, the positron plasma oscillates, and you can pick up these oscillations and find out about uh, density and temperature. Or you can excite these oscillations with microwave. So you can see here different microwave frequencies, and you can see the plasma heating up when you apply microwave. So you see 28.24 gigahertz. Sounds familiar, right? That's a one Tesla field. So you get you know, 28 gigahertz. So we can do that kind of uh, tricks. The other thing we can do is image. We have an MCP. We can throw our plasmas away. So this is positron plasma on an MCP. These are un individual antiprotons here on the MCP. This is a mixing of antiprotons with positrons. This is how the magnetic field affects the positrons. Uh, the other very important technique was to use evaporative cooling for charged species. So this was a, an idea I started in Dan's lab to do with atoms, and we use that for charged species. So here you can see uh, antiprotons going from about 1,000 Kelvin and by evaporating them, getting down to 9 Kelvin. This was done also, there's a study with positrons that I think, I don't know if Daniel has a poster on that or not, later. Anyway, this was very important. The other thing is this technique to make your plasma really tiny in radius, because you don't have, you don't get affected by this in homogeneous magnetic field. So actually you can rotate this plasma, and as you rotate it shrinks, because the magnetic, the, the, the angular momentum is conserved. Okay. Finally, the last trick to be able to get cold enough antihydrogen to trap was we had to send antiprotons into the positron cloud. And the way we were doing before was totally crazy. One volt of kick, one electron volt is 10,000 Kelvin, and it would hit the whole system. So now what we do is, so now the antiprotons are sitting this well, and just beside it, it's the positron. Now we use a, a nonlinear technique. We start exciting these, these antiprotons with a higher frequency here, with a big enough drive, they start growing up, going up in energy, and you start decreasing the frequency because this is an unharmonic well. And so you start bringing all the antiprotons up with a very small energy until they enter the positron cloud where they can form the antihydrogen atoms, okay? So with this trick, we're able, I don't know if I have time to show it, I think so. We're able to uh, trap. So here's a little cartoon video on how this works. This is the detector. It's about this size. Okay, these are the silicon, the silicon detectors here, the silicon plates. Now we have three. If those are at room temperature, okay, if I take them out uh, to view the inside, so this is already inside a cryostat. This, this is inside a big solenoid of one Tesla, and here's your modified Yaffe pressure trap with an octopole and the mirror coils here. Uh, the current goes, goes around this, this, uh, this octopole, and these are two Helmholtz coils. And it's missing here the, the other current. Okay. Now this is all inside liquid helium. Now if I peel this off, and this magnet is deposited directly onto the tube, because a higher order pole magnet, you have to be really close to get the effect of the field. Okay. Now, if I peel it off, I see the electrodes inside. This is ultra-high vacuum already, where we trap the positrons and the, and the antiprotons. So you're going to see the nested trap here. So we keep positrons here, antiprotons here. And now we start injecting this RF to start exciting the antiprotons until they have enough energy to drift into the positron cloud. Okay, now, not with one electron volt anymore, but with a very small energy. Once they hit the positron cloud, it's a very dense positron cloud, so now you can have a three-body collision here. 
in an antiproton with two positrons, and this guy can be kept, so you're, you're captured, you found, formed a bound state, a hydrogen atom, anti-hydrogen atom, and the other positron leaves, okay? Now, if this atom has the right spin properties, it finds itself trapped in the magnetic trap, and if it's at very low energy, how much? 0.5 Kelvin, that's our trap depth. So they remain trapped, and then we can lower the magnetic trap and let them escape, and they will annihilate. And once it annihilates, it emits pions, and we can track those, and we could do, can do an image. Actually, we see it with 100% efficiency almost, okay? So this is the basic idea. So now we show then in uh, 2010 the first result of trapped anti-hydrogen atoms, 39 events trapped for 0.17 seconds, okay? And this was like make the news all over, Al Jazeera and so on. So a friend, a Swiss friend called me up, what's the story about this, how this media think? You guys held nothing for no time at all. This guy is a financer, he works for a Swiss bank. And, and it goes in all this media, and he was right. I mean, we held almost nothing for no time at all. This is not a typical atomic physics experiment, it's more like a particle physics experiment. Anyway, it took us one year to put out this result because we were not clear that we had trapped antiprotons rather than trapped hydrogen, anti-hydrogen atoms. So we had to do a lot of tests, and I'm not gonna describe those. But a little bit, so this was published in uh, Nature, um, and it was made, uh, uh, so was, was considered the, the top breakthrough of the year of 2010, and after the five minutes of fame, actually, now we collected many more events, but still, 390 events, still very little. Okay, um, but you do the obvious thing. Next, uh, once you showed it, then what do you do? You don't turn off your trap immediately. You wait for one second, turn off, see how many are left. You have to repeat that many times. Then you wait for 10 seconds, you wait for 100 seconds, and then you go get a coffee and you wait for 15 minutes and you find that you have trapped atoms for 15 minutes. Okay, so we have plenty of time to do any experiment but we have very few every time. We, we have a, about 0.7 atom per time. So every time we try this whole sequence, which is about 30 minutes, we have about a 70% probability of having caught one anti-atom. So that's the thing we have to improve to do high precision experiments. But we could already do one thing, which was to do a microwave experiment. The atoms are there, trapped. So you are in a magnetic trap. The minimum field is one Tesla. So here's the, the, the field. So if you shine microwave, you might be able to spin flip and release your atoms, okay? And we've done that. It's not really spectroscopy, it's three points, okay? And each one of these points about the, almost the same signal to noise, okay, uh, signal uh, as noise. So I can't call this really spectroscopy, but we had a signal, we published this, first microwave resonance. Uh, we have many ideas to produce more anti-hydrogen and so on. One of them is, uh, I have a proposal that we, we, together with Nisi and Francis Robichaud, that we can microwave cool these atoms. They are formed in Rydberg states. So while they decay, I hope that we can cool them with microwaves. Uh, let me show you, we, do, we are doing a work in Rio, which is trying to produce a hydrogen reference for this anti-hydrogen work after Joachim Raven at Amsterdam, then Kleppner and, and Silvera closed their traps in, in Amsterdam, MIT, and Harvard. There's no more good trap for hydrogen, so we're trying to build one in Rio. And we start this new technique where we create a matrix of neon, and we implant atoms inside this matrix of neon, and we sublimate, and we create a, cold, uh, a cryogenic beam. And our calculations show that we should be able to do a good trapping of hydrogen atoms and small magnetic moment species, okay? And we've shown this beam for lithium, uh, for instance, a two Kelvin beam for lithium that can be used just in the beam to, to get a good reference, okay? Uh, we can do entrained or not entrained in the gas. And the other thing we have just seen is molecules. We can create a cryogenic beam of molecules about, if you shine a lot of atoms into this matrix, you have a probability of one atom sitting the side of the other one, forming a molecule. So we think we'll be able to create any kind of molecule you want, and we have 
then prove this with a lithium-2, rotational temperatures around 4 Kelvin, translation ab about 9 Kelvin, and this is the forward velocity with about 10 to the 9 molecules per cubic centimeter. So we think this is, might be useful for a lot of other experiments. So, and we, we are now trying to, starting to try to trap them. Okay, so what we want to do with anti-hydrogen is do what we have done with hydrogen in the trap, in Dan's lab, which is to do spectroscopy, 1S, 2S, and here are some calculations, an article by Dan and me, uh, about the line shape where we see side bands of the atoms in the trap, and actually we observed that in that, in that uh, first spectroscopy of trapped hydrogen atoms. We see side bands here. And what we want to do is to do that with anti-hydrogen. Uh, once you put the atom in the trap, the energy levels are varying with the field. But this 1s, 2s transition, it turns out that the magnetic moment of the 2s is almost the same as the 1s. There is a residual Zeeman effect. If the transition is done at low field or high field, there is a small difference, which is about this much, in Gauss then, for you, since you asked for Gauss. <laughs> so, uh, we have some calculations showing that you could do a resolution of parts in 10 to the 15, even in the magnetic trap, if you get cold enough atoms. Okay? So it's possible to reach very high precision with the system. So the other interesting thing is this is a tick-tacking clock, as Bill Phillips said yesterday, and it's subjected to gravity. So we're going to be able to test uh, 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 if gravity is the same for this anti-atom as it is for the atom, okay? In particular, the first spectroscopy that we are able to do, we'll be able to rule out anti-gravity because we have enough sensitivity. The first spectroscopy is going to be at parts in 10 to the 12. I can guarantee you that there is no way out, okay? And we have enough resolution to say gravity, anti-gravity doesn't work. Now, whether G is the same to three digits or not, that's a different story. Okay? But at least we could rule out anti-gravity. So with that, um, we, we have then produced this anti-hydrogen, and we can do lots of interesting things with hydrogen and anti-hydrogen, CPT violation test, uh, the equivalence principle, uh, all many other things with, uh, with anti-hydrogen as people have done. So now we, we started building a completely new system with optical access. This was what happened this year. Uh, uh, a totally new system with optical access to start these experiments, which are going to start actually in 2015 because CERN has shut down the anti-proton beam for 15, uh, for 15 months. So basically we have trapped and manipulated anti-hydrogen. We have a new equipment with optical access. We have the first resonant microwave spin flipping with anti-atoms. We have a perspective to do high precision comparison between hydrogen and anti-hydrogen. Do they have the same spectra? Does anti-hydrogen fall up or fall down? Uh, and in Rio, we have uh, developed this technique, which is useful for atoms and, and molecules, called the matrix isolation sublimation. So with that, I thank your attention. Uh, is, are there viable theories that suggest that the antimatter falls up, or does it just fall down at a, at a different acceleration? All, all the evidence is against uh, anti-gravity. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is no direct experiment was ever done. So now CERN approved two new experiments in that AD hall to do a ballistic gravity experiment with anti-hydrogen. So they're going to attempt to make anti-hydrogen in a flight and use interferometers and see if it, what is the G, and they, they think they can measure G to three, uh, to three digits. Okay, let's but all the evidence are against uh, anti-gravity. First, gravity is very complicated because it's not in, in, unified with the system, so people don't really know what gravity is about. So it, it, it is still an open question. Okay, let's thank Professor Claudio Lenz, please.